The process of founding a non-profit association as an umbrella organization for the Drikung Gagyu lineage turned out to be a complicated issue, as many already established lamas did not wish to be subordinated to a central authority that would control all of the lineage monasteries and institutions. But this was exactly the type of structure and problems Chitsang Rinpoche His Holiness wanted to avoid, and he emphasized that he would not allow a central headquarters to hold the strings of power as this would only lead to political manipulation, resentment, and resistance. He had seen that other orders administered by an authoritarian centralized management with strict structures had run into severe problems. Therefore, the Drikung organization would be decentralized, with the centers retaining administrative autonomy, each with its own nonprofit association to obtain subsidies from the state and from private sponsors. Rinpoche did not want an umbrella organization in an administrative sense, but rather in a spiritual one. His basic idea was simple but difficult to implement. Act according to the Buddha Dharma, do good, and earn people's respect. He recognized that rigid hierarchical structures were completely counterproductive to spiritual development as they shifted the focus from practice to politics and position. Using the logo that Rinpoche had designed in the United States would identify the diverse institutions as belonging to the Drikung order. He hoped that inwardly they would all cultivate and perpetuate the lineage's traditions and teachings. Rinpoche initially proposed a three-year rotation in which the headquarters of the Umbrella Organization would move from one monastery outside Tibet to the next, but this system could not be adopted for legal reasons. Therefore, the Drikung Charitable Society would be housed in the monastery Rinpoche was planning. Until that was ready, Ayang Monastery in southern India was chosen to function as the main Drikung Kagyu Monastery and the society was registered with the local authorities in Bangalore. Meanwhile, the lineage had been given a house steeped in the history of Almora, in the foothills of the Himalayas. Lama Anagarika Govinda, the famous German Buddhist philosopher, monk, and artist, had lived there for two decades beginning in 1955. He later left the house to his Tibetan assistants, who then donated it to the Drikung Gyabgong Rinpoche, Chitsang Rinpoche. Almora is located at an elevation of 2,000 meters amidst a forest of majestic pine trees and lush vegetation. Belligerent monkeys, occasional snow leopards, and multitudes of brilliantly colorful birds could be seen near the house. Rinpoche thought that perhaps this place, which might foster both activity and tranquility, the creative urge and contemplation, could become the site for the monastery he was planning. After the New Year festivities of 1983 at Ontul Rinpoche's monastery in Tsopema, Rinpoche gave that year's teachings. During a general assembly of the Drikung Lamas one evening, he unexpectedly requested one monk to retire from his post in order to become the general secretary of the Drikung lineage. And this Rinpoche accepted the challenge. A few days later, they decided to found their new headquarters in Almora. However, it was very difficult because they could not have proper water and the monsoon rains washed away the roads and it would be inconvenient to supply. Finally, Chitsan Rinpoche accepted his secretary's misgivings, although both agreed that finding a permanent seat for the Driku lineage in India was urgently necessary. Jaopo Rinpoche was thus given the task of finding an appropriate piece of land in a suitable area with the necessary infrastructure. He found what they were looking for in Dehradun, a city six hours by car north of Delhi. While Chitsan Rinpoche was receiving the Dangnakso transmission from Dingo Kiense Rinpoche in Bhutan, located in the foothills of the Himalayas, Dehradun enjoyed a pleasant climate and was the favorite retirement place for pensioned British Army officers. It was best known for its numerous elite schools and the atmosphere was very conducive to educational projects. The Sakya Center, Sakya College, and Mindroling Monastery were the main seats of the Sakyapa and Nyingmapa 
in Dehradun. There was also a great deal of land available for purchase, and it became the new capital in 1999 of Uttaranchal, and the city has grown considerably. Buying the land. Delpha Rinpoche discovered a piece of land covered with thick brush in a northern part, and white cranes descended and settled themselves while he was inspecting the place. The purchase price was modest at that time, although in India a price could change from day to day at the owner's whim. Jalpal Rinpoche had only been sent to search for land but not to buy it, since neither he nor Chisa Rinpoche nor the Drikun Kagyu Institute had the capital to do so. But the price was so tempting that he concluded a preliminary contract and went to Dharamshala at once to borrow money from the Tibetan government and send a report to Chesan Rinpoche in Bhutan. The Kyapko Rinpoche agreed to the purchase and Jaupo Rinpoche was able to obtain credit from the private office of His Holiness the 14th Dalai Lama. The transaction was concluded in mid-March of 1984. The Drikun Kagyu acquired the land for 30,000 rupees, a very low price by Western standards, but the Drikun Lamas had no money at all. The loan from Dharmashala was for 60,000 rupees, leaving them 30,000 for construction. In October, after an Achi retreat in Ladakh, Chesan Rinpoche conclusively decided to establish his monastery and study center in Dehradun. The center would be named Drikung Gagyu Institute, and the monastery was to have the same name as the main seat in Drikung Til, Jiang Chupling. Jiaopo Rinpoche began by constructing the access road and laying down water mains, which exhausted most of their financial resources. In February 1985, Chitsang Jiaopo and Ontu Rinpoche, as well as Drupung Sonam Jorpel and Lama Tsulwang, went to Dehradun for the consecration ceremony of the land. According to old customs dating from shamanistic pre-Buddhist times, the local deities had to be placated and measures had to be taken to assure that the project would thrive. The small group carried out the necessary geomantic calculations on the cleared land, and in the place indicated by their calculations, they buried a vase containing rolls of mantras, incenses, and semi-precious stones as offerings. They also performed rituals to request the local deities for their permission and for the peaceful completion of their project. Just as they were beginning construction work in summer of 1985, they received news that Chungsang Rinpoche was coming to visit them. The Kyapko Rinpoche had spent 23 years in Chinese prisons and labor camps working under inhumane conditions, often to exhaustion and sometimes to the limits of endurance. He was released in the course of the political liberalization of 1983 and given a leading position in the Department of Religious Affairs of the TAR, Tibet Autonomous Region. Being assigned this position gave him a place in society, but it didn't provide an opportunity to work for the restoration of religious life in Tibet. The sole function of the Department of Religious Affairs was just to enforce ideological conformity by controlling all forms of religious activity. The office's employees were all Rinpoches and high-ranking Lamas only because they guaranteed public acceptance of the department's authority. Monasteries were compelled to accept external administrations imposed upon them by the department, thus preventing them from regaining any real power. Reincarnations could only be confirmed by the department and had to be sent to China for education and training. At least Chungsang Rinpoche could now visit his relatives in India and Bhutan. In July 1985, Chitsang Rinpoche welcomed his spiritual brother in Ladakh at the Leh airport in the presence of numerous guests of honor. His playmate's face still bore its serious expression, his character as reserved as ever. In Fiang Monastery, the Eastern Holiness and the Western Holiness sat on their thrones, side by side again, and for the Drikung Pa, the sun and moon had conjoined. At the end of August, the two journeyed to Dehradun and visited the land on which the Drikung Kagyu Institute was rising. Chungsang Rinpoche gave Chitsang Rinpoche his support in the effort to set up a viable educational system based on the lineage's traditions. He said that the Tibetan monastic tradition was reaching the end of a devastating epidemic and observing ethical discipline should now take priority. Study and practice should go hand in hand, and if an appropriate education could not be provided, it wouldn't matter if a monastery had a thousand monks, they would be all useless as far as the survival and transmission of Tibetan Buddhism was concerned. Good education was essential, and the Rinpoches and Lamas in Tibet and abroad would have to take a common stand on this issue. 
Cheung Sang Rinpoche continued his journey on his own, and Che Sang Rinpoche went with Jiapo Rinpoche and Lopon Tenzin to Gangtok to receive empowerments and teachings from Taklung Shapjong. At the end of October, they journeyed to Bhutan to a further cycle of teachings given by Dingo Kiense Rinpoche. The daughter of the king of Bhutan requested Che Sang Rinpoche to give an initiation, and he therefore bestowed the Poa transmission in Parozong at the end of November to a huge crowd of people. From Bhutan, Rinpoche set off directly to Bodh Gaya, the site of the Buddha's enlightenment where the Dalai Lama was going to give the Kala Chakra initiation. There, on December 11, 1985, Drikung Kyapkung Trinle Lundrup took the vows of a fully ordained monk from the Dalai Lama. The Dalai Lama's chief secretary provided him with the necessary equipment, a begging bowl, the yellow monastic robe, and a karsil, the staff of a wandering Buddha. Buddhist monk. Alalaho. Thank you guys for listening and hope to see you guys next time for another episode on Buddhism, the Dharma, and other topics of mysticism, perhaps even alien sightings. Signing off, this is Adrian Chen. Looking forward to see you guys virtually on September 11th when His Holiness the Dalai Lama will give teachings in Dharmshala, Himachal Pradesh from his main temple.